Welcome everybody. This is Wisconsin Shoe Guy, and it's been a long time since I've been on video, but I wanted to take a moment today to, to have a conversation with one of the great shoemakers of the world uh, who is uh, graciously uh, elected to join me on here. And so I'd like to introduce you to Tony Gaziano from Gaziano and Gerling. Tony, say hello. Hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here. And, and everybody's really excited to hear from you. Um, you know, this is a new series that we're starting on Wisconsin Shoe Guy, really to talk up to shoemakers and, and get to know them, get to know the craft and understand a little bit more about the shoemaking craft and, and running a business so that we all can be better customers um, as we're, we continue to work with shoemakers. Um, well, I was born in Northamptonshire um, and um, basically the hub of British shoemaking, you know, so uh, I went to school around here and uh, uh, I actually kind of was originally trained um, to be a, an architect, father's a uh, uh, prop developer, that's where he yeah. wanted to go, so but my heart and soul wasn't in it and uh, with, you know, the county being separated at that time, now, you know, 25 years ago with, with the shoe industry, it was an easy choice to kind of try to get into some kind of shoe design. So, you know, that was, that was my original desire was to kind of go into a, um, you know, a shoe industry and start designing shoes. Um, unfortunately for me at the time, I had a, an extremely old fashioned boss who said, to me, you're not going to sit there drawing pretty pictures all day. You know, you need to roll up your sleeves, get on the factory floor and learn everything there is to know about how to make them. So, um, and probably at the time I was a little bit disgruntled with it, but uh, it was probably the best thing that ever happened. Yeah. Um, and, and where did you, uh, um, wh wh where did you start your career? Like which shoemakers have you worked with over the years? Um, I actually started my career at Joseph Cheedy. Oh, wow. So, you know, and uh, I think at the time, uh, the Cheney brand wasn't particularly well known. It was a, a subcontractor factory making shoes for um, Kurt Geiger and uh, doing mostly private label business. Um, and I think at the time it was owned by Kirch's as well. So it was a factory that dealt with a lot of overflow uh, production for Kirch's. Wow, okay. A long way from, uh, you know, hanging a shingle and starting your own shop. I, I love it. Yeah. I mean, there was never a master vision. Everything kind of happened organically over the years. You know, you kind of, um, you know, you do good work and, and, and doors open for you. So, you know, a lot of people kind of seem to think that uh, uh, there was a plan. But, um, you know, I think the, the, the plan was really just to enjoy what I did what I do and, and be very good at it and uh, everything fell into place. Yeah. Well, I can say that, um, you know, and I, and I can only speak from my own experience, right? But the designs um, from G&G &G are, are so much, um, they're, they're just a little bit more unique than, than any of the other shoemakers that, that I've worked with. And, um, you know, I really respect that. And, and I'm sure that the architecture and that your overall artistic vision plays a big part in that. And so um, I'm excited about it and I, I'm happy to talk to you about it. That's exciting. Thank you, thank you, very and, nice. My favorite area is actually pattern cutting. Pattern cutting. So yeah, it's creating the patterns that the picker kicks from. Got it, okay. So, you know, you know, if, whether it be bespoke or whether it be the manufactured side of the business, um, you know, the, First thing we do is create the last. Um, from that last, you have to get forms which represent the inside and outside area of the shoe. Um, and then on those forms, you design the proportions of all the designs that you do. So, pattern cutting is, in essence, what brings a design to life. I love it. Among shoe enthusiasts, there's always been a great debate between hand welted and Goodyear welted footwear, even Blake. And most shoemakers do a little bit of all of these. Can can you share your philosophy philosophy about this? Um, and and thinking really kind of the difference between your ready to wear lines and your 
you know, optimum and bespoke line. I think that my main difference, and probably could bring Blake into this as well, even though we don't do Blake, uh, because I think it's not necessarily uh, um, fair to kind of pitch one against the other. You know, originally, originally Blake uh, Blake shoes were designed for a, a lighter weight, warmer environment is why they were made the way they were made. You know, the soles were thinner, um, they were more flexible, uh, the, the uppers of those shoes were less structured, you know, probably kind of uh, developed more in the Mediterranean countries than, than in the UK. Whereas the welted side of things basically come from military, uh, with a very structured, very hard wearing, um, and, uh, you know, it, it, you know, the two seem to have over years and years and years of kind of, you can get similar footwear made with both constructions, but the origin, you know, Blake is Blake, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a less complicated, less structured shoe than a Goodyear welted shoe. Um, but you'd find it hard to make a Goodyear welted shoe as light and as flexible as a Blake. So. And and vice versa, you know, you kind of you wouldn't get the sturdiness and the structure from a Blake shoe that you would with a welted shoe. Right. So it's it's relevant to the purpose that it was originally made for. Neither one is better than the other. It's just one's more suitable for one type of wear, and the other is more suitable for another type of wear. Now, uh, the difference between Goodyear welted and say like both made welted shoe is uh, obviously with a Goodyear you have a like a what's called a gemmed insole, which means like you have a man-made wood that goes around the outside, uh, around the insole, which the welt is stitched to. Um, and uh, with the well, obviously everybody knows that with a bespoke shoe that the rib is hand carved out of the insole, the holes are all marked, uh, you know, the stitch holes are marked throughout the insole, the rib is then actually hand-stitched, the boat is hand-stitched to that, to that rib. Now again, I wouldn't say that one, for me, is particularly better than another one. It's, it's, uh, it, 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 they, they have a different, uh, almost, they, they have a different lifespan, um, but, the difference is, is that a hand welted rib can be stitched many more times because you're going directly back into the holes that were, were originally made. Right. Whereas, whereas a gemmed rib, over five or six repairs, you start to perforate the gemmed rib because the machine that's stitching the weld into that gemmed rib is slowly perforating the rib away over a long period of time right. i think in terms of you know people people say you know well uh, you know bespoke shoes can literally last you a lifetime so they can be re-welted 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 as many times as you want them to be whereas a, a, a gemmed in sole or like a manufactured shoe probably can be uh re-welted maybe three or four times and you might get that shoe resold every three, maybe four years, depending on how 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 fortunate you are with being able to keep hold of your shoe when you grow. Right. Um, if that makes sense. So you know, uh, even a gemmed welt um, would last you probably fifteen years, you know, with the life of that shoe. You know, so we're talking like a long, long time. If you know what I mean. We are. Um, in regards to kind of which is stronger in terms of the rib, because I've seen this debate before, the glues that are used to put the gemmed rib on, you would actually tear the leather off before you would tear the rib off. They're that wow. strong. The only reason why occasionally you get a gemmed rib come off um, is because it hasn't been attached properly, it hasn't been glued. 
So that's the uh, the the craftsman's fault, not the ribs. So, <laughs> right. Um, but again, you can have the same scenario. You can have issues with with um, uh, with with a bespoke welted rib because you're actually making holes through a man-made rib, which is basically leather, natural leather. There is bound to be strengths and weaknesses within that leather. Um, and occasionally, you know, you can pull a stitch straight through that leather because leather is inconsistent, whereas a gemmed rib is consistent. So, you know, there's, there's all these different elements that kind of add on. And I wouldn't say particularly one's better than the other. They've both got different things yeah no that's 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 interesting and i mean you made the decision in your ready-to-wear line to do the good you're welting um you know and you guys have been around now about 15 years are you doing most of the resellings yourself do you have people go to local cobblers uh is it kind of a mixed bag how, how do you guys approach the the maintenance side of things no i mean traditionally over the years we've always said you need to send um to the factory you know, we prefer to restore um you know all of our of our own shoes you know because the last goes back into um you know the shoe it, it's remolded to the same thing we use the same components it's the same craftsman um we don't have a special production line just for repairs it actually goes through everything the craftsman can make the new shoes as well um, so it's not a watered down version. It's exactly the same as putting a pin on a new shoe. Um, we have had experience of repair people, um, really ruining shoes. Saying that, however, um, looking on YouTube over the last three, four, five years, I have seen some incredibly talented independent shoe repairers. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't but all of two repairers under the same umbrella. As, um, it's kind of like uh, shoemakers in that way, right? Yeah, there are. There's some very good ones. There's some very good ones in, in the US as well. So. Yeah. You know, it's uh, <laughs> most people are not going to be as prolific as, as Wisconsin Shoe Guy and the number of shoes that they have. Um, if, if you were asked for three styles to start with in building a wardrobe, what would you recommend to the to the modern gentleman? That's a hard one because that depends on um, you know, and everybody's lives are changing so much these days. People are less and less uh, required to to dress formally. People right. Are, people are going from casual to slow casual rather than to fully dressed up smart these days, even in the UK. Um, so. I mean, I would I would say that um, you know probably always the most important shoe. Uh, it's probably wrong to call it the most useful shoe. Is probably the most boring shoe. But what I mean by that is is that that a, a, a straight cap Oxford, which you can use for any super formal occasion, you know, weddings, funerals, interviews, whatever, is probably to that everybody should have um but then at the same time you need a shoe that you know that you're going to wear often because um you know you need to know that the shoe from that specific shoemaker is is fitting you and molding to your feet the way you wanted it to and the only way you can do that is by wearing it regularly um right. i think in all honesty with you, there are some companies out there that don't give shoes time enough to uh, break down and kind of mold to your feet. Uh, you need a shoe that you wear quite regularly, and that could be something like a um, you know, uh, dark brown brogue, uh, something like that that you could wear in the office, plus you could wear with jeans. Uh, you know, the key is to those three styles, if you're going to choose them, is versatility. Um, and then I would pr probably put in there a, a Kelsey boot, it's something that it can be worn quite formally underneath a trouser. Um, if you don't know it's a boot, um, and it can be worn 
comfortably at weekends and very cool. Yeah. So, I mean, those would be probably be my three would be the Black King of Hartford, Apple Rogue. Excellent. Um, you know, when, when I started coming up, uh, one of the things, and this was even in like my college fraternity manual, you should always have a matching belt to your shoes. A yep. in, in your business today, do you see a, a lot of folks uh, still doing that and, and consistently buying belts with shoes? Or, you know, as I started to get over 20 pairs of shoes, I started, uh, you know, color matching and, and, and changing my philosophy just because ran out of space for belts, right? So, um, you know, what, what, is, what is common today? Um, yes, it's very popular for customers to walk around with their own shoes. Um, and uh, whether I'm a little bit OCD with this, I could never wear a different colored belt to the shoes right. that I've got on, because I just, I, that just feels a little bit odd. I'd rather not wear a belt. Uh, I think it is uh, important if you're going to wear a belt to, to, to match the tone of the colour of your shoes, but not necessarily the material. So, yeah. for example, you could have a tan pair of shoes on and a tan alligator belt on. As long as the, the colour corresponds, then um, you know, I don't think necessarily the material has to be exactly the same. If, if you had to uh, simplify the decision of going ready to wear or, or going bespoke, um, and let's say time wasn't a factor, right? Um, and money wasn't a factor. What, what would, you, I mean, how would, you, how would you recommend somebody make that decision? It, it really comes down to what the client's looking for, because in bespoke, people come from a, Come to bespoke for numerous different reasons. There, there is a lot of people that come because their foot, their feet just does not suit the format of a ready to wear last. So you know their toes may be slightly different shape or whatever. So they buy bespoke because they still want luxury. They need the comfort as well, and they can't get that from uh, a ready to wear last. Right. So you know. Um, but I think sometimes I see a pattern of a lot of customers go through a journey of buying maybe like 10 pairs of ready to wear shoes. They could be, some of them could be jungle objects, they could be evergreen, some of them could be P and G. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, I need a pair of folk shoes because these shoes look great, but, uh, I'm just not comfortable in them by the end of the day because my feet swell up they ate whatever so and then the whole thing turns around for them because they think well do you know what those 10 pairs of shoes I probably spent fifteen thousand pound on i could have had three pairs of bespoke which fit me perfectly and uh, and, and and i could get up on my feet and get on with the day <laughs> right exactly so you know and that and that's quite important to a lot of people you know i mean there's the old saying you know you can invest in two things, let it be a bed or a good pair of shoes because you're already in one or the other. Right. And uh, so, and that's very true, you know. So, I think, you know, a lot of people have come to me and say, well, you know, it's really distracting with my feet aching through the day. You know, it's nice to actually put a pair of shoes on. I forget about the fact that I'm got a pair of shoes on. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's one element, you know, that's, 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 kind of a decision that I think customers need to go through a little bit of a journey before they actually decide to go bespoke. Right. Um, and, and they may hold on for the cost for a while, but in the end they kind of think, no, I'm just going to do it. Other customers are quite addicted to creating unique things. So, you know, they will um, kind of come along with uh, Sheet of bullet points, details of how they want um, you know, certain areas of the shoe to be, how they want the design to be, how they want the sole to be. Um, you know, and that's um, you know, it's that's quite exciting. That's an enjoyable part of it because then you know, the customers become designers as well, and it's nice to kind of bounce off each other. So, um, but there are customers that are that I would turn around and say it's not worth you going bespoke. 
because the ready to wear ready to order last fit you perfectly um right. and um you know it's it's a bit like myself i probably i don't i think it's ready to wear fine you know, and i like to regularly pick different styles different colors uh if i was a customer it'd be way too bespoke so i just have a lot of made to order shoes ready to wear shoes so you know it depends on 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 what you're looking for um i would never push anybody to go into, into bespoke unless they're actually finding uh a lot of discount that they need to wear, um or they want something designed um or they've got so much money they just don't know what else to do with it <laughs> There is always that. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, last year, um, Cor Corte, Pierre Corte, um, his bespoke house released a pair of shoes that looked like a rock. And, right. um, and, and you know, kind of an interesting little thing. And it, it begs a question, what's the most unusual pair of shoes you've ever been commissioned to make? So many, actually. I mean, I think Pierre uh, is is um who is more into the artistry of things than, than probably what I or we do. Um, you know, I, I kind of um am more interested in the maximizing the elegance of shoes than I than I am, you know, if you made it like a rock or you know, they made that that beautiful shoe, that beautiful thing that was like a car or something. You know what I mean? Right. What I mean? You know, and and I and I admire it, and I think, but that's that's a separate thing. That's art. Maybe one of the most unique things has been has been gold alligator, uh, which has been a twenty two karat gold leaf white alligator skin, and had the gold steels in it. Uh, wow, incredibly expensive, um, and um, you know, and and quite unique, and probably not as um, Oh, as it sounds, because the gold was actually only in the uh, in between scales, right? Um, so, you know, and we have had a few rude kind of uh, shoes that customers have requested. Okay. <laughs> With certain kind of toe medallions and certain things. <laughs> so, um, probably won't mention, but uh, but yeah, no, a few a few things like that, really. Fantastic. Um, you know, a lot of men are really impatient when it comes to shoes, but inventory in, in craft uh, can be very expensive. Mm. Um, how do you how do you approach this? How do you balance the need between inventory and and, uh, you know, not having too much inventory so that you can, you know, still make a living? Well, I think you know, our business has changed a lot over the last. You know, we started off probably more stock heavy, um, and we did an awful lot of uh, private label work for people like Burberry and Dunhill and Kenya and uh, kind of brands. Um, but we found, and I think the world's become this way as well, you know, that people do like customization, um, and you know, you could say any one time maybe years ago in the factory that maybe 500 pairs of shoes in the factory but 450 of those pairs would be part of bulk documentation for us or for other people and then and now you could say 450 pairs of those uh, single customer pairs and then the, the smaller part is, is the stock so we're not, you know, we're not, we don't, we, we do build stock levels, but we don't too highly because we realize, I think, that our customers have gone to develop us into a, almost a custom made business. So, you know, and I think that's one of the niches that we have. You know, a lot of the uh, other factories can't compete with that. Uh, you know, filling a factory full of single pairs is incredibly complicated. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's um, you know, and that's 
direction that we've gone in. Uh, we are looking at now actually at putting um, uh, a fair bit of money into our own stuff because as the major orders start flowing, actually some of the top line starts to come back as well. There is a, an element of customers that don't want to wait. Right. Who want instant gratification. Yeah. And uh, how do you view stockists um, as you approach the business? I mean, I know you have your your shop in, in New York City that's appointment only, but um, it, as I understand it, you don't work with a lot of folks who are reselling the brand. I mean, have, have, is that something that you philosophically want to keep direct or, or is that something that, um, you know, how do you, how do you feel about it? Of course, we are, we are planning to introduce um, a, a concierge service in New York where customers can request somebody to come to their house or their office, uh, be measured and, um, and, 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 and take all of that way. So fantastic. Yeah. But in regards to kind of stockists, I think one, I think our product is too complicated for a lot of stockists to be bothered with. Um, you know, um, there is obviously some good stockists out there. I think Stephen, uh, Chappell of Le Beau is, is, is a very, a uh, good sales guy that understands the way that we work and the way that some of the other brands work. Um, but in regards to kind of things like stores, like the big, more corporate type stores, um, you know, a lot of the sales, sales staff haven't got the interest in learning about the brand. They don't know how to service the product um, and it's made to made and rather represent ourselves and do it well. So. Yeah. Well, in the, um, you know, the sales staff that I've worked with um, at GNG have all been phenomenal. And, yeah, and to your you. point, very knowledgeable, right? It's, it's not about, you know, understanding, you know, hey, this color and this size. It, it's really understanding, hey, what are you looking for? You know, and, and as a sales professional myself, hearing somebody like approach me, like I would approach a customer is, is really good. You know, that that's, yeah. That's the cake. So um, I, I'm, I'm sorry that we're out of time, but I, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to, to, to talk with us today. And um, I, I trust you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Yeah, thank you very much, John. It's been a pleasure meeting you and, uh, and, a, and a pleasure having you. Likewise.